Miss Bibi and Dalton Brothers, and Miss Dorothy, who's in. Uh, I thought about, you know, how they would want to be here taking of the Lord's Supper today. We're not able to. And I thought about them. And uh, if they get to see this, I want them to know that uh, we're thinking of them and praying for them and on that, okay? So let's first start with verse 17. We have to kind of start there because then that helps us to understand what Paul is up against and what he's doing about the Lord's Supper. In verse 17, the Bible says, Now this I declare unto you, I praise you not that you come together, not for the better, but for the worst. Paul starts right off and says, Look, what y'all are doing is wrong, and, and I'm not going to praise you for it. See, most of us, we won't praise all the time. We're not ready to take uh, uh, someone to correct us. We're not, we're not capable in, in our own strength uh, to be corrected. I don't know about you, but I didn't even like my, when my mother and daddy corrected me. I know some of y'all loved it. It was okay. But I didn't like it. I'll just be honest with you. I didn't like it when they did. And I never did believe this. I'm doing this because I love you. When I was a kid. I didn't believe that. I was grown before I ever found out how true a statement that was. They were doing it because they loved me. But as a child, I'm going to tell you something. I'd say, no, you don't. And so I, I won't say that loud because I wouldn't live. <laughs> but I, I thought about it. No, no, you don't. Either. If you love me, you just, you know, wouldn't be there. That's right. Paul comes up because he, because he did love the church at Corinth. He starts off with the he starts to let them know that he's on it. But one thing about it, they still were coming together. They may be coming together for, for the worst of it, but they were still coming together. Because I don't care what's happening in your life and my life, I have no excuse not to serve God, regardless of what somebody else does or doesn't do. Because if I did, I, I wouldn't come to church myself. Because I'm, I'm always having issues and things going on and everything. So, at least they were still coming together, okay? And church, let me say something to you. You ought to get down on your knees and thank God for every problem that you've ever had in this congregation. Because through that, you grow. Through, the, through problems that you have, you grow as Christians. You learn what the Bible says about it. You learn how to do it. And then you grow, then it helps you to overcome that. It's, it's like being anxious for something. Go find out what a big deal. I remember the first shot I was going to get. Ooh, uh-uh, ain't going to give you no shot. And after he gave it to me, I tried to scream and haul and run around and everything else. Finally caught me and gave me a shot. Well, it wasn't nothing. I thought, what? What nothing. That's what I told my kids when they was going to get their first shots. I said, look, you're going to get this shot. It don't make no difference what you do or don't do. You scream, holler, run, or everything. But you're going to get the shot. And it's going to hurt, but it won't last long. And they was anxious, and, and uh, we had to have to hold one of them down. And the other one just went in there and gave a shot. And he said, I wasn't nothing. The other one said, you know, it, you're right. It wasn't nothing that forgot it. But before, it's kind of that unknown. We talked about the Sunday school day. Scared that moment. Paul was getting on this church because they were coming together, but it was for them. Then he's going to tell them the answer, why they were, why it's wrong, and then he's going to give them the remedy. That's one good thing that you can say about God's Word. It can tell you, it can show you your sins, but it also shows you the remedy of it. Isn't that a wonderful book? The Bible that we have that tells that? It's like rubbing me raw, and then he says, I hear I got the salve to put on it to make it feel better. That's the Bible. And so Paul's going to do that. So he says, look in verse 19. He says, For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be manifest among you. That's what happened. There is two qualifications of the Lord's Supper. Salvation and water baptism. Now I've had people question about that. Now, what do you mean water baptism? We have to know. If you go back to the book of Acts, the Lord's Supper was given to the church. Nobody was in the church until they were baptized. That's the book of Acts. They were saved, baptized, and then added to the church. 
So that's how we go. We go by that example of that. That's the, only, that's the example that we have. And I've had people question that, and that's all right. Everybody has a right to be wrong. And, uh, but that's the way we do it. That's the two qualifications of it. Then we ask the question, who's worthy on this thing? Okay? No one. We're made worthy through the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus Christ did. Then we get this verse 19. He says, there's got to be heresies among you, problems, disagreements, wrong things being said and done. It has to happen. You, it's, it's unavoidable. It's going to happen. Why does that need to happen? Why is that? Here's why. Listen to what he says. He says that they which are approved may be manifest among you. That's how you, we tell where someone is in their Christian life and, or, or if they're even a Christian at all about when a problem comes up or something comes up, how they react to it or act to it and how they handle it. I had people uh, that worked for the FBI and uh, uh, counterfeit money. All they studied and told me, all we study is the real thing. I thought, because I asked this question, I said, boy, I bet y'all have a hard time having to study all the different types of counterfeit money. He said, no, that's not what we do. We study just the real thing. Then we can see a counterfeit like that. That makes perfectly sense. All right. Because if you know what's real, you can tell what's not real. So that's what Paul was saying here. He said, you, these things must happen. It, it, that you find that who's approved or who's not. And then he goes on to tell him, he says, when you come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating, everyone taketh before others his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunk. That's why he, he's going through that on it, because there's disorder in the church. Uh, that's what we get from verses uh, one, uh, 17 to 22. We get that. We get that there was a disorder happening. So the problem of the church wasn't if they were worthy to take it. The problem was how they were doing it. And it started from the book of Acts, how they would do from house to house and eat or meet with gladness. And, you know, they, they, did, they did that. They would do the agape meal, which is a, a love meal. What we would have, we have agape meals here. We have uh, fellowship type meals on it. And we all wait on one another. We all kind of do. You know, we don't, you know, some don't go and eat and come back in and, and do that. And some, you know, uh, we just, every, we wait and gather together and everybody eats whatever's brought in there. Everybody eats together. That's the amount of way that we do. Um, but what they were doing, they were, they were bringing the, the God made feast. And there was a bunch getting over here and eating together and a bunch getting over here together and some didn't have any. They just kind of walked around and they didn't get nothing. They maybe didn't have the means to bring anything. They were, uh, and, and, and they, wasn't, they wasn't having the fellowship. And that was the problem that they were having. They, they were <laughs> divided in it. And there's nothing wrong with having small groups in churches. Now, I don't know about you, but my body's made up of a whole lot of different things. My feet is different from my hands. Right? They are. You know. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having a group over here, and a group over here, and a group over here, and a group over here. As long as they're working for the same goal, for the same reason. <laughs> my feet are working to keep my hands going and keep them off the floor. That's why my feet are working. My hands are working so my feet won't have to try to feed me. That's what, kind of how that works. Our body, we're, we're made up of a body, made up of different things. On They're not arguing one another that when the, my hand's not saying, well, I wish I could get it, put, put a pair of shoes on and walk on, <coughs> on the floor. They're not. It's just, no, there's, it's just doing what it does. My feet are just doing what they do. And let me tell you something. My feet, my, my, every toe that I've got has been broken. Every one of them. And they look, they're crooked, they look terrible, they're upside down, look like some of them. My little, my little toe, I don't know what I'm going to do with that thing. It's twisted. Turn, you know, turn, oh, it's not. But 
kind of twisted because of it broke so many times dropping things on it and sticking it in my mouth too much. <laughs> I mean, that'll hurt your food, people. Stick it, have to have it cut out. Every time you have to have your food cut out of your mouth, it's going to be a little bit, uh, it's not going to look as pretty every time, okay? But that's the same way what's happening about this men which are approved. See, that, that's how we tell on this. Now look in verses 23, if you will. We'll look at something. And I, I'm going to read that, then we're going to skip down to, to verse 26, but I'm going to read verse 23 first. He says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, he also took the cup which he had supped, saying, This cup is a new testament of my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. One of the things that Paul said, he said, I'm going to give you instructions about taking the Lord's Supper. And, and that's, that's what it was. The whole instruction was that when you take the Lord's Supper, there's a reason to take it. The manner in which we take it to remember what Jesus Christ has done, that his body was broken, that his blood was shed. For my sins and your sins to help me to be all that God had me to be. That's the go, that's the reminder of the Lord's Supper. That's what that's what it is. Now, we probably, you know, I've had people say, well, you know, you, you gotta do it this way, you gotta do it that way, you gotta do it that way. Well, if you want to go back that far, go back and do it like Jesus and them did it. And, and, and drink out the same cup. Boy, I said that in the church one time. They was talking about, you know, we need to do this exactly how Jesus did. So I brought one cup. You know what? They said, we can't take the Lord's Supper like that. And I, you know what? I don't drink after nobody. I don't drink after Susie. I may run her down and kiss her in the mouth, but I'm not going to drink after her. I'm just not going to do it. You know. There's a difference in that. Yeah. And, uh, but so we're probably not, you know, people are, we can't do it exactly how they do it. That's not the issue. The issue is in the manner that we take it. If it's one cup, two cups, three cups, whatever. That's, it's the manner that we take it. And that, I, that what I'm doing is to remind me of what Jesus Christ has done. In doing that, that reminds me that poor, I need Jesus more and more and more in my life. That's what, it, that's what this service reminds me of. And I'm glad we're starting it on the first Sunday of the year of 2024 to remind me the rest of the year I'm going to need Jesus Christ to help take care of me and to guide me and to lead me. Now look in verse 26, we get something about it that reminds us of our Lord's death. And that he's coming back. Let's look at verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. So my life is living as though Jesus is coming at any time. Now if you put that together, if you put that together that Jesus died and that he's put in a grave and that he went to heaven and that he's coming back, that ought to that's that's ought to motivate me and motivate you to live closer to the Lord each and every day. Because he can come back at any moment. It can happen on it. So the bread represents his body broken. That's what it is. That's what that bread when he broke that, that represented how his body was going to be broken. And I, I encourage you when you're taking the Lord's Supper day to just crack that little crack. Uh, unleavened bread that we have just kind of just remind you uh, that Jesus' body was broke for you. And the cup represents His blood that was shed for us. I've had people say, there wasn't enough blood in Jesus' body or the whole world to cover my sins. It just took a drop, folks. That's all it took. It was more than that. It was a bloody sight. See, we look at, when we look at the crucifixion and we have pictures of it on it, and I, I don't encourage people to have those, but if you think of them, they got a little long cloth around them, a little white cloth around them and everything like that. That's not the way they hung them. They hung them stripped, stark, naked on the cross. 
shameful death how they did. And if we could see the blood that was really there from the crown of thorns all the way down to where he'd been beaten and how the bloody mess was on it, on his back when it was against the, the cross and everything, it would, we, we couldn't look at it. It, it, would, it. We would turn our heads from it. Because it's not something that we think ought to be done for someone. But Jesus did that for your sake and my sake. And that ought to be the motive that Jesus loved me and that I love Jesus of serving Him and everything else on to do that. Look in verse 27. Here's the part where most people get confused about the Lord's Supper. And the Bible is not confusion. It's just straight out. It tells you exactly about what it is. I mean... I've heard this and probably said it in my younger ministry about, you know, if you're not worthy, uh, uh, don't take the Lord's Supper. I was in a church on vacation one time, and it's a huge church. I mean, there's over a thousand people there. And the pastor got up and had preached a wonderful message, but never said one word about the Lord's Supper. Then right before the, it's the end time, here they come rolling them in in carts. Carts of, of the bread. Carts of the, of, of the uh, cup. And he said, now we're going to have the Lord's Supper today. And all y'all that feel like you're not worthy to take it, get up and leave. And there was hundreds of people got up left. And my heart was pounding inside me going, no, no, no. That's not what the, the Lord's Supper is about. If there's a problem in your life that you think you're unworthy to take it, come before God and ask God to forgive you and help you to do it. Amen. But that's not that the reason that Paul is writing this. It's not that they were worthy. But he would want them to do that for sure. I wanted to go to the door and stop the door and say, don't go here. Go to the altar. Don't leave. Go to the altar. Because here's what, here's what they were saying in that. They were saying, yeah, there's sin in my life. And the preacher says that we have to be worthy to take it. Now, I'm not worthy, so uh, I'm just going to leave. What, was, what people are saying and doing, and they said, there is sin in my life, and I'm not worthy, and I'm not going to let Jesus help me today. Can you imagine what a slap in the face that is of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins and my sins, and, and, and would leave when it, the answer is right there, and He wants to help you? That's what they were saying. Basically, that's what they were doing. I, I got the same life, but I, I don't want the Lord to help me today. I don't want to help him, get Him to help me overcome that. That's worse than someone who doesn't, who is ignorant of taking it and don't know what they're doing. Because we all, as Christians, ought to say, yeah, I want to take it. And if I thought it was being worthy, being it, and there was something, I would come. And that's what I do every time I, before I take it. I say, God, help me to overcome. I, want it. I am not worthy to take it. But because of you, you made me worthy. Because look at verse 27. He said, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily. Did you catch that word? It's an adverb word. It's an action word. That means they were just taking the Lord's Supper, wasn't concerned about nothing, wasn't concerned about nobody else or anything else. They were just taking it because they just put it part of the agape feast. It was a part, they just thought it was a part of the meal. That's why Paul would say to them, didn't you have houses to eat in? It's not a meal. This is not a meal. This is something between you and God. <coughs> this is a personal thing that you have on it. It's not a meal, a fellow, it's not a fellowship meal. It's not, it's really not even a time of, of we think, well, you gotta be in good fellowship to take it. It's not even that. It's the fellowship that you have with God that counts, not with somebody else. It's with God that you have. And that that goes in hand in hand for sure. It says you shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And then in verse 18, he gives us the answer to verse 27. You'll love this verse that why he was to give to us. It says, let a man examine himself. Okay? 
I'm not worthy. I can, I, it doesn't take me but two seconds to examine myself to realize that I'm not worthy to take the Lord's Supper. But here's what I know. I know I got saved. I know when I got saved. I know where I got saved. I know I'm saved today. And because of that, it's made me worthy. He said, let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Notice that it didn't say examine yourself or sin in your life and don't eat it. It don't say that, does it? It says to eat. Let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread. Because what that bread reminded me of what Jesus' body was broke for me. And, and drink of that cup because his blood was shed for me. That way, when I examine myself, I see that I fall short, but because of what Jesus Christ did, can help me overcome that. So through that, I'm worthy because of what Jesus Christ has done. And, and that's what I'm remembering. That's what I'm thinking about. That's what is on my mind today. What Jesus Christ has done for me. And that He's coming back. You see, we forget that part. Because we've heard it so long. We've, every generation that's ever been has, has talked about the Lord coming back. He's going to come. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. All through the Old Testament. You know, they're looking for the Messiah. Then John the Baptist comes. He's here. And, and Jesus comes. The kingdom of God is here. Now. Behold, the kingdom of God is at hand. But he's coming back. And he's going to take us with him. That's why I believe in the rapture. The second coming and the rapture are two different things. We know when the second, we know when the second coming is going to come. We don't know what day or what uh, time is going to be, but we know what event's going to cause it. We don't know what event's going to come uh, uh, on the rapture when the Father sends His Son to come and get His bride. We don't know that. But we know the day and the seven year tri tribulation ends, Christ is coming to earth. We're told that in the Bible. We know that for sure. We know that's, that's, a, that's a sure thing. On but examine yourself. And, and then we get to take our supper. Look in 2 Corinthians. You want to know uh, what it says in uh, chapter 13, verses 5 and 7. Listen to what the Bible says. It said, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. You see, that's the whole thing. Is Am I in the faith of God? Am I trusting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? Or am I doing something else? Prove your own self. It's between you and the Lord. No one can make you be a Christian. No one can make you serve God. No one can make you be a disciple of Jesus Christ other than what God would have you to be and to help you to do it. No, you're not. You're not. You're not. You're, you're not your own. We're not our own self. When you got saved, guess what? You quit belong. You don't belong to nobody else but Jesus Christ anymore. You can't do what you want to do. I've had people say, I heard a preacher even say that one time. He said, now, to get saved, it doesn't mean you can't do what you want to do. I don't know whether that statement is true. If you if you're want to, it's what the will of God is. That's not the way that statement is true. No, when you get saved, I can't do what I want to do. I don't, I, you know, I, I, I'm going to the Lord. I've got to come under His guidance, under His will. Because His, His, you know what? He's took responsibility for me. How many of y'all have ever been a boss in a company or something? Come on. If you had a worker said, if you was a teleworker of what to do, and he'd say, but I don't want to do that, I'm going to do it my way. Now, I, I, I've owned a company. And if I had a man come, if I told a man what to do, and he'd say, I don't want to do it the way, I'm going to do it this way. I'd say, look, you've got one way to do it. You got to do it this way or the highway. I wouldn't give them two choices on it. And here's why. Because if it was wrong, then I was responsible for it. If they did it, guess what? Two people would be responsible. Me letting them do their way and them the way they did it. If they were did it wrong. So I'd say, look, boys, here's what to do. Even if I'm wrong, I get blamed for it, not you. So we're going to do it that way. Guess what? God, He asks us to do something. 
because he's always right, never wrong, and always going to lead it in the right direction. And that's why I can't say, well, I'll do it my way. But that's the problem. People want Jesus Christ, but they want him his way. There used to be a song. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. How many of y'all heard that song? That's that was that's so unbiblical. That was a, one of the that was a gospel song. That one time on the radio. Me and Jesus got I don't even know how it goes anymore, but got our own thing going. Uh -uh. It's Jesus has his thing going. You're either on board or not. That's the way it is. Because what? I don't belong to myself. You got saved, you don't belong to yourself. Then it says, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be a reprobate. Now, if you're saved, Jesus Christ is in you. If you're not, then you're not saved. If Jesus is not in your life, you are not saved. That's just the way it is. He's either in or not. You either got saved or, you, or you're not saved. That's how that works. But I trust that you have that you shall know that we are not reprobates. That's what we need to say to you. I want you to know that I'm not one. We, a lot of times those preachers get accused of being one because of the stand that we take. What we say sometimes have to take a stand and do. We get counted at. But guess what? We do it because we love you, not because of any other thing. He says, And I pray to God that you do no evil. Not that we should appear approved. He said, he was right and said, look, I, don't do anything wrong. And he said, I don't want you to think that I'm above that. I have to hear the same thing. That's what he said. He has to drink out the same cup. But that you should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobate. He said, even if I am a reprobate, do what God had me to do. You know what that's saying? Listen, just because somebody else acts like a, a lost person doesn't mean that I can or should. I'm responsible for my own action. You're responsible for your own action. And that's, that's what Jesus Christ is teaching us in this. That through Him, I am made worthy because of His strength, because of what His salvation has brought on me, that I, I can do that. There's a warning in this to judge ourselves in verses 11, chapter 11, verse 29 to 34. One is in verse 29, it says, They was not discerning the Lord's body. That was the number one thing. They wasn't realizing that they were taking the Lord's supper. What they were doing, they thought they were eating a meal. It got so common among them that they thought, Well, this, this cup and this bread is just, it's just part of the meal. Not realizing that it was something to bring them in remembrance that Jesus died for them and is coming back. And, it, and because of that, there were people, God was putting judgment on people in that church. And he said, but if you're a judge yourself, you should not be judged. It's how you judge you're, yourself. You judge them. I'm not going to judge you this morning. I don't judge anyway. I, I, any Sunday. I'm just going to tell you what the Word of God says. And that's a, between you and the Lord. But it's to judge yourself, to see. And if, listen, if, if you think there's something that will hinder you from doing the Lord's Supper, come to God and ask God to help you get over it. And then take the Lord's Supper. Don't slap Jesus in the face for what He did. Say, I want to overcome that. I want that out of my life. I want to get that out of it. And here's why. That we should not be condemned. Not get a judgment on us. All those things. Listen, folks. To be a child of God is a dangerous thing. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the Lord, the Bible says. That means I cannot do what I want to do and expect to get away with it. Because why? God knows everything. Now, I did a lot of things my parents didn't know I did. I know none of y'all did that. I know all y'all was perfect angels. But let me tell you something. I did things growing up that my mom and dad never knew, but they died without ever knowing what I did. Because if they did, I would probably not be standing before you today with a straight, with, with a face, with a nose not over here or something. I mean, uh, no. They, but God, He knows everything. 
I can't hide anything from Him. Whatever I do or don't do, God knows about it. And God can know exactly how to give the right judgment and the right thing to do and when to do it. And it's a fearful thing for us Christians to fall into the hands of the living God and we'll think we can live how we want to live and act how we want to act. It's a dangerous thing. Because why? My father, your father, God the Father, knows everything about us. And he knows how to correct us. He knows how to give us a pat on our blessed assurance that counts. I remember one time I was with a bunch of boys and they said, uh, let's stop in here in the poo hop. And I said, no, I can't. Wow. My mother thought to find that. You big baby, you mama's boy and everything. I said, I don't care what y'all say. I got to live with that woman. Y'all don't. I'm not going in there. And I didn't go in there because, you know what? My mother said she ever caught me in there. I wouldn't be able to sit down for a month. And she meant it. If I were to catch you in that, I remember we was coming through there one day, one of my buddies was going into the, the side street pool hall there. And uh, she said, if I were to catch you in there, what were you going to be able to sit down for a month? Well, guess what? She never caught me. <laughs> Your kids have one these days. <laughs> okay? Never caught me in there. Because her orders on it. You see, we might fool one another, but we will not fool God. With every head bow and every eye shut, here's the moment. I don't know where you are in your relationship with God the Father. If you've never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then you have no relationship with Him. He knows you, and you know about Him. But He's never, ever had a relationship with you. There's a big difference in that. That's what Jesus said. He said, depart from me, I never knew you. It wasn't that He didn't know everybody. It was that He had never had a relationship with Him. God wants you to be saved so much that He said it's not His will that any should perish, but all will come to repentance. Timothy, that all men might be saved. All mankind might be saved. It's His will. He wants you saved. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian and, and uh, life's year was just a tough year for you. Sometimes you thought about giving up. God kept it just tapping at your heart. And I love you. I want you to know. But you maybe you don't feel like, or maybe there's something in your life that you think it's hindered you from being all that God had you to be. Bring it before the Lord today. Call upon Him to help you to overcome that. Because none of us are worthy to take the Lord's Supper, but because of what Jesus Christ has done, it makes us worthy. Of course, often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till He comes. His death that is coming again. That motivates me to love him more and to serve him more and to watch for his appearance. What motivates you? That's the big issue today. Now, Father, help us as we go through the rest of the service. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen.